Hello everybody, and believe it or not, we have reached Dry Dock episode 100. So more in the channel admin section about how we're going to celebrate that because it's coincided with a couple of other happy events as well. Anyway, on with this week's questions. And today's questions are taken from Guide 168 USS Balao and the Armed Merchant Cruisers and Raiders video, as well as obviously Patreon questions at the end. BK Zhong asks, why is Imperial Japan often singled out for the mistake of building battleships in the carrier era? So I definitely think some of this does come out of the sort of post-war propaganda elements that try to diminish the uh, Japanese Navy's efforts in the Pacific War, which I've always found a little bit odd. I mean, as I've said generally before, if your propaganda goes out of its way to diminish your enemies, you're also diminishing the achievements of the people on your side who fought against those enemies. But that's a story for a completely different question. Anyway, the thing you've got to remember is that at the time that Yamato is entering service, everybody else is still building battleships to one degree or another. Okay, fair enough, the Lion class are on hold and have been will be eventually cancelled. The H-39s aren't going anywhere fast, but the Italians, for example, still building Roma, and the Vittorio Venitos, uh, well, Vittorio Veneto and uh, Littorio, are, are sort of the, the paint is still drying on them. Uh, Bismarck, to be fair, has been completed. Tirpitz is pretty much done, but again is still in the process of working up to final operational readiness. And as we said, the Germans were planning on building the H-39s if it hadn't been for the war. It wasn't because of the carrier threat that they stopped building them. The British are still building the last few King George V's, uh, completing them. The US Navy in late 41 is still working on both the South Dakotas and the Iowas at varying stages. So... Yeah, the fact that the Japanese are building Yamato and Musashi, it's not particularly remarkable around late 41, early 42. I think, to be honest, the reason they get a bit more stick than others, and again, perhaps unfairly, is more to do with the role that the Japanese were looking to employ them in, rather than the fact that they existed at all. So, if you look at the European theatre... Battleships still had a role to play in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is just too small for the kind of grand-scale carrier battles that you see in the Pacific. And to be perfectly honest, um, the Italians didn't have any carriers, uh, at least none that they completed. So you can't have a carrier fight if one side doesn't have any carriers. You can't fight the land aircraft. Um, but yes, as, uh, generally, if one side only has battleships, they're going to use them. And with the confined waters, you need at minimum battleships to escort your carriers. And, well, battleships make very good counters for other battleships, again, in confined waters. And in the more northern waters with the Kriegsmarine, with the best will in the world, the Kriegsmarine's numbers are too low. And it doesn't really make that much difference on a strategic level, whether they build two Bismarcks two, or two Graf Zeppelins or one of each or whatever it's not going to affect the overall strategic outcome of the war. Yes, it might lead to a number of different tactical situations, but you'd get different tactical situations if you built four 15-inch armed Scharnhorsts rather than two Scharnhorsts with 11-inch and two Bismarcks or whatever. So the Germans kind of get a pass because when it comes to capital ships, they say whatever they built, they're not going to win the war with them. The Italians kind of get a pass because well for the reasons we just mentioned and the royal navy at least in the european theater definitely gets a pass because well if the other side is building battleships and well north sea uh denmark strait mediterranean they're all fairly confined waters you need battleships of your own plus it has to be borne in mind that the capabilities of carriers when war broke out in europe in 1939 were very, very much less across the board, both in the Japanese and US navies, as well as the Royal Navy, as compared to what the capabilities of carriers, especially in the Japanese and US Navy, where they'd had a couple of years of effectively peacetime to build up their forces. So by the end of 1941, it's, it's a completely different uh, subject, basically. Uh, 
And, well, when you enter war, you kind of, to a certain degree, enter a, uh, a period of stasis. You you continue to iterate on designs, but you don't that often, when it comes to something as important as a capital ship, see a massive shift in strategic uh, aim when you're in the middle of a war, because that can be very dangerous. And with the US, whilst they obviously do build the Iowas, as again, I think it comes down to role. In the Pacific, you don't see the US Navy generally using battleships as the decisive arm or part of the decisive arm. Outside of a few skirmishes at Wild Will Canal, etc., you generally see them being used as carrier escorts or shore bombardment vessels or some variation on those two themes. Whereas the Japanese are still trying to use their battleships as a decisive striking arm of their navy to counter American advances. And I think it's the conflation of that, which by mid-42, late-43, using battleships without carrier support as some form of decisive striking arm, that is definitely an obsolete concept. I think this is why you see the Japanese getting a bit more stick for continuing to build battleships. I mean, they they convert Shinano to a, a carrier, let's face it. Um, nobody else did that. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think that it's, it's that... Uh, plus, obviously, Yamato being the ultimate expression of battleships, at least in terms of displacement, that, that gets them a little bit more scrutiny than others. Now, of course, that's not to say the Japanese didn't use battleships as escorts for other air groups, including carrier groups, which they obviously did, but it's, it's incidents like the Battle of Samar and such like that really, and Tengo, that really seem to put the Japanese on a back foot when it comes to post-war analysis as to why they were continuing with the battleship. Trey Atkins asks, I've often heard that the US succeeded in doing to Japan what Germany tried to do to Britain in regards to submarine warfare in World War II. Could we get an explanation as to whether this is true or false? So in the wonderful tradition of these kinds of naval questions, the answer is, well, yes, but actually no. <laughs> so let's examine exactly what Germany was trying to do to Britain, and then we'll look at um, what the US managed to do to Japan. Germany was trying to knock Britain out of the war by cutting off its overseas supply network by obviously sinking merchant ships. Now, the idea of that obviously was that if you starved Britain of raw materials for its war industry as well as food and other supplies, it wouldn't be able to carry on. They would face massive shortages and they would be forced to sue for peace. Now, obviously, clearly, they failed to do that, although they did come close to succeeding at some points. Now, let's have a look at what the US did to Japan. Now, did they manage to pretty much cut off Japan from the bulk of its imports? Yes. Did they manage to sink vast numbers of Japanese merchant ships? Yes. Was the Japanese anti-submarine warfare effort effective against them, especially to the same degree that the Kriegsmarine suffered at the hands of the Royal Navy? No, the Japanese anti-submarine warfare doctrine was lacking, and the execution also. Now, obviously, again, that's not to say that the Japanese had no idea how to do anti-submarine warfare. There are a fair number of wrecks of US Navy submarines littering the Western Pacific, which are testament to the fact that, yes, the Japanese could, in fact, hunt submarines. They just weren't as good at it as, say, the Royal Navy was. So you might think, well, did, you, did Japan suffer severe food shortages, material shortages? Was their war machine impeded by the lack of imports? Again, yes. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, clearly the US managed to achieve what Germany didn't. And in that narrow focus, the answer would be yes, in fact, they did. They managed to pretty much put a noose around Japan's uh, economic neck and tighten. However, bear in mind, as we said earlier, that Germany's efforts against the UK were designed to knock Britain out of the war, to force it to surrender, or at least come to terms, because they had no other choice. Now, whether that be due to resilience, stubbornness, or 
just having slightly more reserves to start with, well, and the fact that people weren't hammering down land borders because Japan being an island didn't have land borders, the US submarine blockade of Japan, whilst incredibly effective, did not knock Japan out of the war. In fact, it took two atomic bombs to knock Japan out of the war. And as I said, there's a multiplicity of reasons for why that was the case. But at the end of the day, much like the general conventional strategic bombing campaigns, what it appeared to show was that you could definitely hurt an enemy with a submarine blockade if it was effective. You could smash their economy, you could begin to starve out their population, but it didn't actually knock Japan out of the war in and of itself. So this is why I say in, in terms of the tactical objectives of what Germany was trying to do to Britain, yes, the US Navy did manage to do that to Japan, undoubtedly so. In terms of the strategic objective, then no, uh, neither the Kriegsmarine nor the US Navy was able to knock their target out of the war by means of submarines and torpedoes. Polygon Dwana Land asks, Amphibious Assault Sub? What? <laughs> so this comes from the Balao class video where I mentioned that two of the Balaos were converted into amphibious assault submarines post-war. Uh, here's one of them, USS Sea Lion, along with its sister USS Perch. These were the two vessels that were converted. Now, the reason for this conversion is actually following on in the fine tradition established by the USS Argonaut, as well as the Narwhal and Nautilus, which were very large submarines the US had built in the interwar period, and turned out to be too large and basically too unmaneuverable and unwieldy to be realistically used in significant anti-shipping operations. They did try, um, and indeed, Argonaut would end up being sunk in the process of attacking a convoy. However, there were smaller and more capable submarines were able to do that kind of frontline duty. And when you consider how large things like the uh, Balao class and the Gato class actually were, that gives you some idea of just how big Argonaut, Nautilus, Narwhal, and some of the related submarines actually were as well. Anyway... They, those aforementioned three, saw service in World War II in part as troop transports landing what we today would call special forces, i.e. raiders, commandos, scouting forces, etc. Which, obviously, they were relatively well suited to. They were large enough to carry a small number of forces and their relevant landing craft, albeit sometimes these were just motorised rubber dinghies. And, of course, being a submarine, they could approach relatively stealthily. So this idea was carried forward. Now, obviously, Argonaut had been lost and the other V-boats, which was sort of the loose designation under which some of those other vessels fell, were far too old to be continuing service well into the uh, Cold War period. And so the Balaos, well, initially, uh, apparently, it was planned to convert quite a few of these so that you could use them as a small collection of underwater landing craft that could pop up and deploy a relatively substantial US Marine force at a moment's notice. Um, however, as it turned out, it would just be Sea Lion and Perch that got the conversions, and they would be used, again, apparently, because this is Cold War era stuff, to land various special operations related uh, missions. Now, exactly what that was and how that went and what those forces consisted of, what their objectives were, etc. There are some details that are better known, um, such as Perch's involvement in the Korean War, but f for fairly obvious reasons, I think, once you start going further into the 60s and stuff, the information is somewhat more scarce, dash somewhat more questionable, shall we say, um, without massive amounts of official backup, so... Yeah, that, that's basically what I was referring to. And if there is non more non-classified information on what they got up to, and anyone happens to know where people might find that for their further education, please feel free to chime in in the comments. But as I say, this, this period is a little bit beyond my comfort zone. Juicy Sushi-san asks, 
four gun turrets. Only the French and British seem to have tried them. The British turrets seem to have been less successful. Were the French turrets similarly poor? So quad turrets or four gun turrets, they do seem to get a fair bit of stick and in some cases rightfully so. However, there are a number of circumstances you have to bear in mind. The French actually generally, as far as the turret goes, had a much better time of it, at least as far as capital ship guns went. Now, I say oh, as far as capital ship guns went because the French also invested in a couple of smaller caliber quad secondary turrets. And, um, well, yeah, let's just say the uh, the Dunkirk secondary battery didn't quite prove as effective as they'd hoped, and that was one of the major reasons behind a number of redesigns on the Richelieu and subsequent variants, at least as far as secondary battery went. Now, if we're focusing mainly on the capital ship turrets, you've effectively got f three classes to look at. You've got the Dunkirks, the Richelieu's, um, both on the French side and, of course, the King George V's on the British side, although there is an interesting uh, aborted one, which is the quad 14-inch that were planned for the USS North Carolina and USS Washington. Uh, they ended up get getting triple 16s, but the design was there. So, in terms of success, the French had two primary advantages when it came to this. One was that they'd done an awful lot of work looking at the Normandy and Lyon classes in World War I, so they had a pre-existing base of design expertise when it came to four-gun turrets to work with. And secondly, when they started doing it in the interwar-world War II period with the Dunkirks, they were able to launch Dunkirk and Strasbourg in peacetime, which meant that they were able to identify any potential problems and work to fix them in peacetime conditions during trials and both that and obviously the experience with the world war one era designs could go on to inform the Richelieu's quad or four gun 15 inch turrets so overall as as I say as far as the actual turret itself goes the french generally had slightly fewer problems than the british the british launched straight in with the quad gun turret um, or four gun turret. I'm, going, I'm just going to call it quad gun because it's easier, um, even if it's technically incorrect. Um, they launched straight into that with a King George V. So obviously, initially, like the North Carolinas, they planned to have three. They cut it down to two and a twin. But nevertheless, the problems with it that were experienced, especially by Prince of Wales during the Battle of the Denmark Strait, are fairly widely known. But on the other hand, they are somewhat over exaggerated. Because, for example, although some one or some guns did have issues with firing during the battle between King George V and Rodney versus uh, Bismarck, which of course King George V is a King George V class, and there were one or two uh, minor issues with Duke of York's armament when they were fighting Scharnhorst, neither of those two ships had anything like the level of problems that Prince of Wales did, and the reason for that is fairly clear. Prince of Wales was a brand new ship. It was still in fitting out stage, effectively. It had the civilian dock workers aboard um, still trying to fix the issues with the newly built turrets. And, well, it was fortunate that they did because they helped get keep at least some of them in operation during the Battle of the Denmark Strait and thereafter. Now, the thing you've got to remember is, one, any new built ship is always going to have teething troubles. That's why you have a trials period. Um, and second... Pretty much, uh, King George V and Prince of Wales had kind of launched straight into the war, so they didn't have the advantage of peacetime uh, to conduct extensive trials to work out bugs and issues and then report down the line for further ships on how to fix them. Now, even so, the experience that was l learned with King George V and Prince of Wales went on to inform Duke of York, Anson and Howe, and so you don't hear much about their problems, as I said. But at the at the baseline, whilst some of it can be explained by the fact that yeah, new ship, no trials, etc., there were some issues with the British quad uh, gun quad turret design that weren't so apparent in the French ones. 
Um, and so, yeah, they they, re- they required it resolving. I mean, it's pretty much like the uh, the triple sixteens on the Nelsons. They had a lot of issues, mostly down to that they've been put on too ambitious of a diet to fit on thirty five thousand tons. But regardless, um, the French turrets overall did have a number of issues, but on the Richelieu's specifically, these related more to the guns themselves rather than the turrets and their tendency to spontaneously disassemble themselves, which, to be fair, was in large part actually down to the shells um, and not so much to the guns. So whilst as an overall system, both British and French ships did have issues with their four-gun or quad turrets, with the French, it was more down to the projectiles and to a small amount the actual guns themselves, whereas with the British, it was down to a combination of, say, basically rushing the ships out and a few underlying design problems with uh, the quad turret that, well, you'd expect them to experience, given that they had nowhere near the same kind of uh, background in it as the French did. And it would have been very interesting to see what would have happened if the North Carolinas had launched with their quad design and how well that would have worked out. Pekka Makela asks, did anyone ever equip armed merchant raiders with torpedo armed float planes so that they could find and strike at more ships without revealing their location to anyone? So there's two main issues um, with that idea, one of which is that even a float plane, which tends to be somewhat lightweight compared to some naval strike aircraft, needs a fairly substantial rig to get it into the air and then back out of the water again. So it needs cranes, it needs a launch rail, it needs a catapult, it needs a hangar, etc. And an armed merchant raider specifically, in a large part, gets by by pretending to be another merchantman, at least at a long range in visual inspection. The amount of gear that you would have to put on to enable it to both carry, launch and recover float planes of any description would be fairly substantial and it would be very difficult to disguise that, um, which kind of circumvents a lot of the point of having an armed merchant raider in the first place. The other problem is that whilst scouting float planes were somewhat larger than, say, a fighter, they also generally weren't quite as large as torpedo bombers. And that's important because a torpedo bomber has to, well, obviously carry a torpedo, and a torpedo is actually quite a heavy piece of ordnance for a single-engine World War II aircraft. And a float plane is already carrying a fairly heavy, fairly drag-intensive set of uh, loads, i.e. the floats themselves. So an aircraft that was capable of being a float plane torpedo bomber would be quite big, quite hefty, and that just multiplies all the issues that we mentioned earlier about storage, etc., etc. And basically, that kind of unit didn't really exist. And given the performance penalties already imposed by the floats, if you're going to stick something as heavy as a torpedo underneath as well, that is aircraft is going to be very heavily compromised in performance um it's either going to have extremely low speed or extremely low range or possibly both and definitely very low maneuverability at which point given that you're probably only going to have one and it's going to complicate your ability to stay disguised quite massively it's going to take up a huge amount of your space and volume on the ship and if you go after anything with even so much as a rudimentary anti-aircraft armament, there's a fairly large chance that your wallowing torpedo float plane will get shot down. It means that it just wasn't a practical, viable concept. In theory, it makes a nice idea. But to be honest, if you were going to do it anywhere, you'd probably maybe try and do it off of a battle cruiser or a battleship, maybe a large heavy cruiser. Um, but there are issues even then because generally airdrop torpedoes are of a different size to surface launch torpedoes so you can't have a commonality of parts and you'd still have a lot of issues with the, the size of the aircraft and the facilities you'd need to keep launch and maintain it even on a ship of that size. Sir Liv asks a fairly long question which basically summarises as Would it have been a wiser strategy for Imperial Germany in the First World War to have reduced or even eliminated its armed merchant raider program and use said merchantmen as blockade runners instead? 
So I'd say, no, not really, because the number of armed merchant raiders that Germany had, if even if you convert them all to cargo ships, their cargo capacity in and of itself can't keep Germany running, um, and they're still quite vulnerable. Yes, a lot of them are fast. However, they also burn a monstrous amount of coal, especially when we're talking about the big ones like the liners. Um, this is why the British basically dropped a lot of the big merchant ships, a lot of the big liners that they'd brought into service as armed merchant cruisers very quickly into the First World War because they realised the fuel expenditures just made it ridiculous and insane to try and keep them going. And as I say, while they are fast, they are fast for merchant vessels. A good cruiser or a flotilla of destroyers can still catch them. Um, for the most part, battle cruisers as well, and well, to get back to Germany, well, they're not going to come up the channel. That would be suicide. So if they're coming round through the North Sea, escaping the North Sea block, well, trying to break through the North Sea blockade, they're going to get caught. I mean, yeah, one or two might make it, but their sailing isn't exactly going to be a mystery. Um, and so their arrival in the sort of operational area can be predicted to a certain extent. And, well, you might be fast. You ain't running out running a shell. So even if the ship, even if you, the ship is theoretically maybe two, three knots faster than a cruiser or similar that might be waiting for it, all that cruiser has to do is get within gun range. Now, obviously, if it's a tail chase, that's one thing. But if you're trying to break through the line... If the cruiser is ahead, all it's got to do is position itself in such a way you've got to come past it and it can shoot at you. And as was proven <laughs> by the various armed merchant cruisers and armed merchant raiders, merchant ships don't deal very well with gunfire, uh, especially when they're heavily loaded with cargo, uh, which would slow them down. Instead, as you might have guessed from the picture that's been up during this question, I think if the Germans were thinking at all about a potential war with the UK and bear in mind that's something they really didn't actually want the Kaiser wanted to challenge the UK certainly but he he didn't actually want the UK involved in a war with Germany especially when Germany was involved with a war with so many other people at the same time but if their thinking had gone that far I actually think they would have been better off investing in more cargo submarines they did build a couple Deutschland and Bremen the first of which is pictured here and it did prove both profitable and workable when the when it made its maiden voyage now obviously this only really works for as long as the united states is neutral and willing to trade with germany but in world war one at least that's actually a significant portion of the war and whilst a cargo submarine can't obviously transport the same levels of bulk cargo that a liner can germany is not short of most bulk materials about the only really big bulk material that they are shoot short of is high quality coal but to be honest the british have the market cornered for a lot of that anyway um but most of the other stuff they need is materials that are vital for the war industry but actually in terms of their actual need per month comes into tens to like maybe low hundreds of tons usually rare rare materials for alloys and stuff Food is another matter, but again, even the combined uh, merchant tonnage of the various armed merchant raiders, even if none of them are intercepted, is still nowhere near enough to make up for the um, issues with the German food supply. And if all of them were making it through, then the British blockade was, would have been it would not have been anywhere near as effective as it actually was. But regardless, in terms of strategic materials, you could do it with something like Deutschland or Bremen, and they were only a couple of thousand tons. If they're thinking ahead, I'm pretty sure the Germans could have come up with something a bit bigger that they could have mass produced, maybe something in the three to five thousand ton range. And bearing in mind that these cargo subs spent most of their time on the surface, they're not like combat U-boats and everything. They don't have to be quick. They don't have to be agile. Literally, all they have to do is submerge long enough to get past the British blockade, and then when they're out in the middle of the Atlantic, they can pretty much cruise around like any other merchant ship. If Germany had built a fleet of those, maybe a dozen or more, 
that would have seriously diminished the effectiveness of the British blockade because, again, whilst things like co good quality coal and food would still be running short, strategic war materials needed for the uh, industrial side of war, Germany arguably could have kept up a decent supply of. Now, how that affects the overall outcome of World War One is a completely separate matter entirely, but it certainly would have made things a lot easier for Germany compared to how they were historically. Robin Payne asks, you mentioned both armed merchant raiders and armed merchant cruisers. What is the distinction between these? So on the surface, you might think, well, they're both armed merchant ships. Surely there can't be too much difference. And yes, on visual appearances, you might be correct. But there are some subtle differences. And it largely comes down to the role. Now, an armed merchant cruiser is generally designed to support the fleet in blockade duties and hunting down armed merchant raiders and the like, as well as the occasional persecution of enemy shipping. But uh, the, the fact it is an armed merchant cruiser generally tends to suggest that that navy has the upper hand, numerically at least at sea anyway, and so it doesn't need to be particularly subtle about what it's doing. Whereas an armed merchant raider again, as the name suggests, is explicitly there to raid enemy merchant shipping. And so it has to be a bit more covert about it. So with an armed merchant cruiser, they're not going to make any particular efforts to hide the armament, um, the weaponry, and their mission profile is also going to be quite different. And so therefore how they're loaded is going to be quite different. They're going to be looking at, obviously, keeping some civilian crew around, most likely, in order to keep the ship running because they know the ship better than anyone else but you're probably going to see either navy officers and men or reservists manning the guns possibly in command um, and certainly filling other relatively senior positions on the ship because it's effectively being treated as just a slightly weird and not particularly armored naval vessel and it, its crew is going to be kept to a relative minimum. You'll have maybe a couple of small boarding parties for stopping enemy shipping, uh, but that's about it. So it's it's loud, it's open about what it is, and it will usually be painted in all sorts of weird and wonderful colours. Whereas an armed merchant raider, as we said, needs to be as covert as possible, so they're probably going to stick to their peacetime colours. They are almost entirely probably going to be naval crew, because there are some dicey legal issues about civilians acting as raiders that tends to get into pirate territory, which is probably not somewhere you want to put loyal patriotic crewmen. They have to operate a lot of the time pretending to be in, in anything but an armed merchant raider, so they have to pretend to just be a regular old merchantman, and that means that any weaponry they carry is going to usually be concealed in some manner. They're also going to be carrying a slightly different balance of weaponry. So they will quite often be carrying mines for laying in enemy waters. Later on in World War II, for example, they may also be carrying torpedo launchers and such like. Um, generally, the the scale of the weapons they're carrying might be a bit smaller because, again, easier to hide and the ammunition's easier to carry. And pretty much finally on the armed merchant raider side of things they will also be carrying substantially more supplies and most likely crew as compared to an armed merchant cruiser because an armed merchant cruiser will just go on a patrol so it needs the supplies for that patrol and then it will go home or go to a friendly port and restock an armed merchant raider needs to be prepared to stay out and about for as long as possible or as long as needed and therefore it's going to be packed to the gunnels with fuel, supplies, and the reason it might have additional crew is because they're expecting to capture multiple enemy ships and they're not going to have other ships that they can hand those off to. And assuming, obviously, that they're not sinking them, if they are actually capturing them, they're going to need prize crews. And with prize crews, obviously, that means more men on board until you've captured a ship. So actually, overall crew numbers on an armed merchant radar might be higher. Uh, obviously, whether or not you are going in with the intention of capturing enemy shipping or you're just going to sink it all will dictate that to a certain extent, but it is certainly much more of a concern on a raider than a cruiser. Kiwi Hame asks, Why did the British not run Q-ships in World War II? 
did they even have merchantman-based commerce raiders? So the British in neither World War I nor World War II ran merchant-based commerce raiders for the most part, and that's largely because, well, a merchantman-based commerce raider is very much the tool of the underdog, and navally-wise, in both wars, Britain very much was not the underdog. You use commerce raiders of any description when the enemy has a lot of commerce for you to raid, and if you're Germany, well, the British do have a lot of commerce for you to raid. They they need a lot of commerce to head to their ports, so you might as well um, go with raiding it. Whereas the Germans didn't have as big a merchant fleet as the British did to start with, and with the blockade that had been put in place, most of it that they did have wasn't getting anywhere near Germany anytime soon, so there was no reason to go raiding outside of that because the British could be pretty confident that within a few months pretty much any German merchant ship that wasn't already in German waters would either have tried to run the blockade and failed, uh, possibly tried to run the blockade and succeeded, at which point they're now stuck in Germany and the chances of them repeating the feat are very slim, or would have had to be interned in neutral ports, or potentially caught by various Royal Navy cruisers. And whilst the Royal Navy didn't have anywhere near the number of cruisers that it wanted, it certainly had a lot more cruisers and other such vessels out and about on the oceans than someone like Germany did. So there just wasn't the need for merchant commerce raiders in the Royal Navy, because there basically weren't any targets for them to go after. Now, as far as why they didn't run with Q-ships in World War II, well, the Q-ship concept was already on its way out in World War I, thanks to the Germans figuring out the idea and beginning to get a bit wise to it. And everybody knew that by the time World War II broke out, well, the Germans were going to go straight in with the no-warning, unrestricted submarine warfare uh, tactic, which they did within hours of war being declared. A Q-ship relies on a U-boat surfacing and coming after it with either an inspection party or a deck gun, and knowing that 99 times out of 100 that isn't going to be how the U-boat's going to deal with the merchants anyway, there's no point to a Q-ship at that point. Uh, it's just going to be a another victim, and just a slightly more expensive one, and takes a valuable merchant hull out of the convoys. If there is a merchant ship that's capable of being armed with guns and is relatively handy with them, the much better use for them is to actually put them into service as an armed trawler or some other form of armed escort for a convoy itself, rather than send them off as bait for U-boats. Because an armed convoy escort might help drive off or sink multiple U-boats. Uh, to be honest, by World War II, a Q-ship might distract a U-boat once. Adam Ladd asks a two-part question. First, USS Wyoming versus HMS Agincourt, Battle of the Turret Farms. And also, are there any better trolls that the Royal Navy has played on an Allied Navy other than naming a ship HMS Agincourt whilst fighting on the French side? Well, in the first case, I'm going to give it hands down to the Wyoming um, with one important caveat, which is that if you're going to have a Wyoming versus Agincourt fight, you need to have that fight after the US Navy has been has formed 6th Battle Squadron for a while and got its gunnery up to spec. Because if it's before that, then Agincourt, being with the Grand Fleet and having had its gunnery trained to a point where it can actually hit the broadside of a barn, will probably triumph on the grounds of it will hit something and Wyoming probably won't in time. However, assuming that gunnery on both sides is equal and vaguely acceptable. Although Agincourt does have uh, some extra guns, it also has the armour of a battlecruiser, and Wyoming has the armour of a battleship. So yeah, if, if they're flinging shells at each other with a roughly the same chances of hitting each other, Wyoming is much better built to take hits than Agincourt is. Now, okay, fair enough, a long-range engagement, even the 9-inch armour is probably enough to protect it to a degree, but the minute that range closes, Agincourt doesn't have any substantial protection against Wyoming's broadside. The reverse is not quite true, unless it goes into absolute melee range. 
So yeah, Wyoming definitely has plenty of cards to play in that particular fight. Again, assuming gunnery is equal. As far as the Royal Navy trolling Allied navies potentially not... Well, I wouldn't necessarily by accident, but potentially not entirely maliciously. Well, you've got the fact that the Royal Navy flagship for the majority of World War One, again when they're allied with the French, is HMS Iron Duke, i.e. the Duke of Wellington, um, which is probably a little bit more of a poke in the eye for the French even than Agincourt. I mean, to be honest, most of the Grand Fleet could be considered a kind of sideways troll on the French Navy in World War One because, well, if you look at the names of the Royal Navy Dreadnoughts, Dreadnought herself, Bellerophon, are both ships that were in the Napoleonic era uh, Royal Navy and uh, present at the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, Temeraire, of course, also present at the Battle of Trafalgar and a captured French vessel. St. Vincent, both a battle and uh, the Earl of St. Vincent, Admiral Jervis, a fairly famous for fighting against well, both the French and the Spanish. Collingwood, another admiral. Vanguard, another Napoleonic era ship. Same with Neptune at Trafalgar, Colossus and Hercules. Uh, I think Colossus was at Trafalgar, I don't think Hercules was. Orion, um, that was present at the Battle of the Nile. Conqueror and Thunderer, both present at um, various of Nelson's victories. Uh, Okay, fair enough. King George V is the current ruler. That one's not a troll. <laughs> There's probably one of the few that isn't. Um, Audacious and, okay, fine, I give in. Ajax. Um, both, again, names of Royal Navy ships from the Napoleonic era. Iron Duke, we've already mentioned. Marlborough, Duke of Marlborough, famous for beating the French. Uh, Admiral Benbelt, famous for beating the French. Uh, HMS Emperor of India, kind of a 4D troll, but well, it's kind of saying, yes, we, we knocked you out of India, if you happen to be French. Um, Agincourt, obviously, we've mentioned. Um, Canada, also something that we took from the French. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, ironically, not actually a, a particular troll on the French, believe it or not, since she did most of her fighting with the Spanish. Um, Warspite, again, was a Royal Navy vessel that fought the French. Barham Admiral, who fought the French. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, you, you can kind of see the point as you go along. Uh, whilst it was fair enough, it was Fisher trying to evoke the spirit of the Napoleonic era Nelson, Nelson Navy and the Battle of Trafalgar, being allied with the French whilst simultaneously naming most of your battleships for either battles, admirals, or ships that had done a very good job of beating the French... Yeah, that's kind of one na gigantic navy-sized troll there. And on to the Patreon questions. BFW asks, What was the extent of painted camouflage for warships during World War II? Who did or didn't use it? And for what reasons did the navies choose their stance on camouflage choice or lack thereof? Well, everybody used camouflage. You've got to remember that even the standard grey, well you say standard grey, every navy had its own shade of grey, but even the standard grey of a given navy was a form of camouflage. It was designed to help the ship blend in to the sort of hazy boundary between sea and sky that you normally found in most oceans. And this is why, for example, a number of US camouflage schemes actually mostly consist of blocking out the hull in the colour blue. Because the Pacific is less known for uh, Horizon Haze compared to the Atlantic or the North Sea. And so a blue colour, when you have blue seas and blue skies, will actually help you blend in more than a grey colour, which might actually show you up <laughs> considerably more. I mean, obviously these days air conditions have changed and that might not necessarily be the case, but it certainly was the case in World War II. As far as the rest goes, um, there were multiple different camouflage schemes on multiple different vessels in all navies that were adopted throughout the war for all sorts of reasons. Um, so here we can see HMS Rodney in one of its rather more fetching camouflage schemes, which was a really weird mix of greys, whites and greens of all things. But a lot of it depended on where they intended to use the ship, but also what kind 
of conflict they were fighting. And I say that because if you look at the various camouflages that were used, you can discern something about how the navies were thinking about using their vessels. So the Germans, for example, really went all in with the false bow waves and trying to conceal the actual size of their ships. So if you look at uh, quite a number of their ships, especially the capital ships, what you'll see is that the bow is painted in a sort of a very light to medium grey, again designed to blend in with its surroundings, and then you have a black portion of the camouflage and that portion is quite stark, usually has a forward rake, and quite often has a false bow wave painted under it. This is designed to give both a false idea of the ship's speed and also the ship's size, and it does actually seem to have worked in a number of cases, especially because the Germans, outside of the uh, Königsbergs, which didn't really go anywhere, um, apart from Norway, the rest of the German large vessels, when you talk about things like the Admiral Hippers and the Bismarcks, and even to a certain extent the Scharnhorst, although they had a different turret layout, generally had a similar visual profile, um, especially obviously if you're looking from the front, and so if you could mess with somebody's perception of how big they were, you could confuse what exactly you were facing, hopefully underestimate them, and thus you could get closer in and fight. And then when the shells arrived, people were like, ah, I was not expecting 15-inch gunfire, I thought this was an Admiral Hipper class. As we mentioned, the US Navy had a series of blue camouflage schemes. The Royal Navy had a whole bewildering variety of camouflage schemes. I mean, there's two or three whole books on Royal Navy and Commonwealth Navy camouflage during World War II. Some of it, to be fair, was configured for different environments. So there was camouflage schemes for the Pacific, for the Mediterranean, for the Indian Ocean, for the Atlantic, for the North Sea, etc., um, which in part helps explain the weird and wonderful variety. But they were also iterating on um, various designs. The objective of most of the designs was to try and throw off people's perception of the vessel, not necessarily to make them underestimate or maybe even overestimate the size, but more of just making them much harder to spot properly. So um, obviously broken up patches of different colours of grey are even better than single monolithic grey and just blending in with the environment. Um, but also if some of them are, they're, while they're not necessarily dazzle camouflage schemes, a lot of them well, you do see dazzle camouflage in convoy escorts, um, but a lot of other sort of mainline warship uh, design uh, camouflage designs are definitely intended to give people a false idea of perhaps where the ship is heading or how fast it's heading. False bow waves again occasionally being a thing, um, or blending in with the background when you're not expecting the background to just be a uniform sea and sky. Um, so <laughs> The Japanese have their own ideas on camouflage, but that's an entirely separate topic, to be perfectly honest. Um, as the war progresses and air attack becomes more and more of a problem, you start to see a camouflage scheme shifting a little bit from patterns that are designed particularly to confuse spotters at surface level towards patterns that are designed to either conceal or throw off the, an enemy's aim when that enemy is high in the sky, i.e. air attacks and such like. And this is kind of to a certain degree when even decks start to change colour quite significantly because, well, you're never going to spot a deck from an enemy warship unless you were already far too close, but from the air a nice bright polished teak deck does show up rather wonderfully as compared to a much duller colour that might blend into the ocean. There's a limited amount you can do with that because obviously ships have wakes which make them much easier to spot and smoke and such like but you know every little helps if you're if if the sea is particularly choppy a wake might get lost in the chop but uh, yeah a really bright teak deck isn't going to be whereas if you dull it down in those kind of conditions you might actually miss the ship. Clayton Godet asks, why, with naval diesel engines coming to service in the early 1900s, did warships continue to use steam-powered propulsion until after the Second World War? So there are quite a number of reasons, actually. For one thing, diesel engine technology doesn't advance quite as quickly as steam turbine technology. Remember, steam turbines were ready for installation aboard HMS Dreadnought back in 1905, 
whilst half a decade and more later when Prince Regent Luitpold was under construction and the Germans wanted to put a single diesel engine for cruising on her central shaft, they couldn't actually make one ready in time for her, so she had to go without. So there was that. Obviously, a certain amount of industrial inertia sets in, and when one type of engine has a six to uh, to eight year lead on the other one in terms of both reliability and attainability, well, that's going to do a certain number on things. As well as that, initially, when they were first introduced, the price of fuel that diesel engines could burn was about twice as much as what as the oil that steam turbines could burn. And bear in mind that oil firing generally wasn't actually adopted across most navies uniformly until probably middle of World War One into the late 1910s, early 1920s. So, and, well, you can theoretically run a diesel engine on extremely powdered coal, but it's not necessarily the best thing for it, and it's also very dangerous for the ship itself. So um, the strategic availability of oil was a major factor in the adoption of oil firing generally, let alone the adoption of diesels, specifically in what well, the sort of the 1900s World War One period. Now, fair enough, the turbines did burn more fuel than diesels did. Diesels were more fuel efficient, but still, um, when you confront somebody with an enormous bill for filling a tank with diesel fuel as opposed to filling a tank with bunker oil, at least in the the early part of the 20th century, someone's going who's signing the checks is going to blanch a bit at filling up with the diesels. Now, obviously, they did later figure out that you could run diesel engines on stuff that was a lot cheaper, which was good. But also in the early part of the 20th century, diesel engines were less reliable than steam turbines, um, which is a very important factor for warships. Diesel engines were also not as efficient. They were more, they, now, this is an important difference. They were more efficient in terms of how much fuel, fuel they burned to go a certain distance uh, or generate a certain amount of power, but they weren't as f- efficient in terms of space, i.e. the generated power per cubic meter or cubic foot or cubic yard or whatever cubic me- measure you want to use was not as great. So if you wanted to produce, I don't know, 80,000 shaft horsepower, you could do that with a smaller steam turbine plant than you could a diesel power plant. And space is at a massive premium aboard warships. And the machinery space is already one of the biggest spaces um, aboard a warship. So if you've got a power, two power plants, one of which can produce your given amount of power in, say, 80% of the volume, you're going to do that because you can then use that spare, well, not spare, but your remaining 20% of volume as compared to diesels for other things like magazines, supplies, crew, extra weapons, and the displacement as well, because obviously that space would have been taken up by heavy machinery. The displacement can also go into things like more weapons, armor, etc., etc. The other thing is that for a very long period of time, diesels flat out could not generate the power output that was needed for the high end of propulsion, which is what you got with warships. So, for example, you have things like, say, the diesel-powered Deutschland class in the 1920s. The fact that they went with a diesel power plant is one of the reasons they can only hit 28 knots, whereas comparably sized and slightly smaller cruisers running steam turbines can quite easily overhaul them by four to five knots. And... Well, when speed is at a premium, well, it's not so much a premium in merchant shipping, um, except when you're talking about the odd ocean liner, but it's definitely a premium in warships. So there there were a multiplicity of reasons mitigating against the use of diesels in most forms of warship um, during the early part of the 20th century. Now, once things started to change and... Diesels got more efficient, the cost of bunker fuel for uh, steam turbines went up, the cost of fuel for diesels went down, and mainly the refinements of diesel technology, uh, especially the fact that you can build a diesel engine a lot more easily and a lot faster than you can a steam turbine, uh, 
this is when diesel started to overhaul the steam turbine in terms of number of power plants installed on a given ship and you would then see diesels taking over generally however during the first part of the 20th century diesel engines and were still relatively prevalent aboard ships just not as their main power plant but they were present in quite a number of cases as auxiliary power units supplying electricity um, and hydraulic pressure to various systems within the ship especially damage control Texas and La Shock asks, Looking over the Virginia-class attack boats, I found a couple of amusing items. The motto for USS Texas, SSN 775, is Don't Mess With Texas, um, which is somewhat associated with the state, but actually started as a slogan for an anti-litter campaign. The upcoming USS Utah, SSN 801, got its name because the telephone area code for Utah is 801. Are there any other in-jokes in the names, registries, or mottos of other historical ships? So there are a few, and although the name still doesn't sit right with me, HMS Ajax has the motto, or had the motto, Nec quisquam nisi Ajax, um, which is my attempt at Latin, but the meaning of that phrase is none but Ajax can overcome Ajax. It doesn't literally translate to that, but that's what it actually implies, which is kind of saying, yeah, no one can beat me, only I can beat myself, which was, uh, to be fair, kind of true. The The ship did survive World War II and a couple of fairly major hits, so maybe they had a point. Whilst it was unofficial, the USS Hawkbill, which was a Sturgeon-class nuclear attack submarine, was nicknamed the Devil Boat or the Devil Fish uh, because it was SSN 666. Uh, someone had to have a fairly wry sense of humour when they launched uh, USS Rhode Island, SSBN 720, because its motto, when translated out of Latin, means in hope of everlasting peace. And, well, if it unleashes its payload, they'll probably get it. You do, of course, also have HMS Zubian, which was the combination of HMS Zulu and HMS Nubian, which were both blown in half, except the opposite ends were <laughs> salvageable, so they welded them together. That was definitely an in-joke playing on the names of the two ships. And Alan Smith asks, how did World War II deck parks work? I understand the advantages in terms of increased aircraft capacity and faster turnaround time, but what about on days when it wasn't a day to launch a mass strike? Your carrier might need to still fly off some combat air patrol, surface search, or anti-submarine patrols, which might not need all the planes in your deck park. And even if it did, you wouldn't have all your planes taking off and landing at the same time. So were they able to strike the excess below, or did they just have to shove the park planes back and forth on the flight deck in order to open up whichever end they wanted to use? So how you'd use the deck park is very much situational on what you're doing. If you're going just generally cruising around, you can have the deck park wherever you pretty much like, and it's not going to be much odds. If you need to run limited air ops, but you know or you're pretty sure you're not going to need the majority of your air group, then you can store some of your deck park down below and some of them on the sides. So you can open up a sort of a central passage or if you storm their one side, a uh, passage and a side to sort of fall off if you haven't absolutely have to. Um, and yes, that's going to make everything very cramped down below, uh, but the, well it's better than not having an operational flight deck um, because you can, you can fit a lot more aircraft in a carrier's hangar, especially once all the wings are folded, um, than would normally be rated on a ship's carrying capacity. And that's because the ship obviously, as a combat unit, needs to be able to bring up, warm up, cycle, etc., load, maintain, and, and all these other things, the aircraft in its hangar as well as those on the flight deck. If you if you just need to run a few aircraft, then you can absolutely pack the hangar deck right up to the gunnels and, as I say, then just have a few on the side of the flight deck and you can run your limited air ops very well. But it's going to take a little while for you to extract the um, aircraft down in the hangar now that you've made into a bit of a mess. Whereas, obviously, once you, if you've got all the deck park up and you need to launch a mass strike, well, then you just fly off all the aircraft and then when they come back well they're all coming back and you're probably not launching any any time soon and you'll probably be cycling pe uh, aircraft down into the hangars anyway so yeah deck parks work in a variety of ways but it 
it generally involves for low level ops just shuffling them around into the hangar and onto the sides so you can keep the air operations running or in the case of some particularly large carriers like uh, one pictured here our Lexington class if you've only got a few aircraft left on the flight deck you might even stick them in the middle because you can you then you can run takeoff and landing ops at the same time although you better hope your crash barriers behind your parked aircraft work very well and that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. Next week's Dry Dock will, of course, be the Patreon Dry Dock. So look out for the Patreon Dry Dock live stream on Friday evening, where we will answer the some more speculative alternate history, etc. kind of questions. And then obviously the main Dry Dock on Sunday, where we will answer the more historical-based questions. Now, as far as what you're all waiting for what are we doing to celebrate 100 episodes of the dry dock well it's kind of a tr three-way celebration we're celebrating 100 episodes of the dry dock we're also celebrating uh, a few weeks ago the video on uss texas passing the million view count making it the first video on the channel to surpass a million views and about a week and a half ago we also surpassed the random arbitrary marker of 150,000 subscribers so Yay! Well, not go me, but go you guys. You're the ones who are making those figures happen. So, of course, there will be a little bit of a giveaway going on. And, um, well, let's put it this way. I'm not going to try and give away quite as many heavy objects as before. Because, um, well, let's just say the shipping costs for the 100k subscriber giveaway were quite extensive. Nonetheless, um, there will be a few books in this giveaway. There may also be a few models, both kit form and uh, sort of final build if you like, but there will also be a selection of naval photos and postcards, which are pretty nice to have, pretty nice to have up on a wall. Um, I can put a little compliments card and a message in with the envelope as well. And best of all, they post in small envelopes so the postage cost especially now that usps has decided to more than double the cost of shipping things to the united states is a lot less than trying to send a small parcel containing a sort of kilo to two kilo book um, there will be also a, a number of books and other things on offer that uh, ones that i don't specifically have here but i, I will have a number of books that effectively if you win and you want to go in that category i'll provide a range that you can then ask for and i'll just purchase it from amazon or a books or whatever relevant book company there is and have it shipped to you as part of uh, that which will probably be a heck of a lot quicker and <laughs> cheaper than shipping something straight from my house now, as for exactly how many prizes are up for grabs, I'm still counting them. Um, there'll probably be something in the order of three dozen or so to give away. Um, there's also will be the option if you're on the EU or NA servers of World of Warships and you want a premium vessel, then uh, a premium vessel up to tier five, maybe tier six if I'm feeling generous, will also be up for grabs in certain numbers. So how do you enter, I hear you ask? Well, considering that last time the uh, leave a comment in the thread below broke YouTube's comment sections and we had to keep loading new ones, I'm not going to go with that. What I will do is included somewhere down below in the video description will be a survey monkey link and that will take you to like a, a two, three question form and it will basically be what is your YouTube username? so I know who to say you've won to. Um, secondly, will be your probably first and second, maybe even third preference for a prize. If you do happen to be the lucky one who is selected or one, one of the lucky ones who are selected. And thirdly, as a kind of just a, a little filter to make sure everyone's paying attention, there will be a simple question which I'd say 99% probably doesn't have a wrong answer which is who is your favorite historical naval commander um, the only categorization that has to be fulfilled is 
they have to be historical, i.e. they have to be dead. Um, uh, so yeah, other than that, that, that's the three bits of information you need to fill in, and then when that comp when that sort of giveaway closes, which will probably be maybe a couple of weeks, give everyone a chance to uh, enter, so probably end on the 12th of July, then I'll run the good old RNG and see what numbers pop up, who wins, and then in probably the either the dry dock of the 12th or possibly the dry dock of the 19th of July, I will announce the names that have won. You will then have one week to write in and say, yes, that's me. Um, here's, here's how uh, I'd like to receive my prize. And if there are any unclaimed prizes at the end of that week, then I'll just run another RNG run for the unclaimed prizes. So I think that probably wraps it up for this week. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much for indeed subscribing because it's n not without you guys. I can't get to this point. And I hope to see you again in another video some point soon. Thanks very much. Bye.